Hello everyone and welcome back to Amos, our course on Agile methods and open source software. We are in class session two now. In the very first class session, I taught you about the basic tools we are using and you had your first team meeting, which probably was rather chaotic as first meetings uh, usually are. Today, I will tell you or teach you the basic Scrum process as applied to the Amos project. So my hope for today and all future team meetings after this class session is that you will be able to have a regular and structured and effective uh, process. Before we begin, here is a reminder. As you commit to your code repository, make sure that you sign off whatever you commit. And if there are any co-authors because you're pair programming, please do not forget your co-authors. All right, our agenda for today is the overall AMOS process and then specifically the structure of the team meeting, which ends the old sprint and starts the new, what to do there. And let me say it right away because I will have to repeat it. This slide deck is your best bet at getting the team meeting right and it will provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to have your team meeting. You should have the slide deck open as it guides you through the different stages. But I will return to that. So. AMOS is uh, the AMOS project is an instance of the general process framework of Scrum. Well, Scrum needs to be customized or adapted or instantiated, whichever way you view it, it's a framework. Scrum at a university like an AMOS has its own unique challenges. Sometimes people will say, oh, it's a university project, that's so easy and they're completely underestimating the specific challenges of uh, coming together for an effective and successful project at a university. Because the uh, people in an AMOS project, you, the students, uh, may well have very different abilities and experiences. There's nothing wrong with that. Diversity of this is great, but it does mean that, well, you're differently capable on different dimensions. Also, at a university, you're usually not 100% on the project. You are in multiple courses, so your brain will be distributed in many different tasks. You form transient teams rather than persistent teams, which has the challenge that you have a time horizon of three months, and then maybe you won't see those other people uh, again. At work, in a company, you expect the other people to be around and you need to get along with them. Um, you may not be all available at the same place, not at the same time, though of course we require that you be present in the team meeting and that's the point, the focal point of the course. Well, I hope you're not too motivated by grades, but such extrinsic motivation sometimes comes into play. So what are we doing? Well, we are instantiating Scrum in such a way that it fits the university. We have one team meeting rather than separate sprint planning and sprint ending meetings. Uh, we provide a lot of support and so forth. How specifically? All of that is to follow today. <clears throat> so here you can see the overall timeline of an Amos project as shortly touched upon in the first class session as well. An AMOS project, like any Scrum project, is split into multiple, many, well, a whole stream of so-called uh, sprints. A sprint is a time box. It's a defined time frame, a defi has a defined duration. That duration, uh, in the case of AMOS, is one week. Your work is split into one week increments. Every week you will go through the basic scrum cycle of planning your work, doing your work, executing your work and reviewing, uh, releasing and doing a retrospective on your work for process improvement. Before you start the next sprint, the next cycle or in more general terms, the next time box. 
In addition to having a sequence of sprints, uh, 14 in total in Amos, you will also have two more important points in time, the mid-project release and the final project release. So there are two more important uh, points in time, the middle of the project and the end of the project. Based on this work, Scrum as an Amos is structured not only as time boxes, but time boxes with results. So there needs to be a deliverable at the end of the time box. If the time box is small, it's a small deliverable. If the time box is larger, like uh, middle or end of the project, it's more. And uh, this value increment, as Scrum calls it, in our case, as we are developing software, is usually a software release. A release is a named, identifiable, consistent, hopefully useful snapshot of the software of the product you're developing. With the time horizon or time box of one week, one sprint in Amos, you call it a sprint release and it is what you deliver or release as your work of that sprint. And separately, what we call a project release is a release uh, of your software at the midpoint, then it's the mid-project release, or at the final day of the course, or of the demo day, then it's the final release. And these are called project or product releases. Since we're doing a project, we call it a project release. And since the time box is much larger, seven weeks, um, the project releases are expected to be of significantly of significantly higher quality than obviously the sprint releases. This is all mapped into time and you can look at the schedule tab at amos.uni1.de as usual. So software development work is communication and coordination work. Scrum gives you a particular logical structure of your work week or more precisely the uh, time box that Scrum gives you, which is the sprint, which happens to be a week in Amos. And such a logical structure of a sprint starts with sprint planning. So you're planning the work you want to do. And then it ends with the review, release and retrospective. During review, you look at the work that you did during the sprint, then you decide whether it's any good, whether it meets the expectations, what you wanted to achieve, and then you decide to release it or not. And then you perform a so-called retrospective in which you look over your work and decide on what could be improved and uh, perhaps do it, meaning process improvement. In between these two bracketing meetings, the sprint planning and the closing of the sprint, you actually do the work. So it's planning, doing and reviewing. This doing itself is uh, also a bit structured. It's actually fairly open, but it has a few more meetings in an official Scrum setting, which would be to have daily Scrums every day, which are also called daily stand-ups. And I explained them in the first class session already, but let me do it again. These are meetings where you uh, tell the other people who are present what you uh, uh, did since you last talked about it, what you're going to do next and what problems there are. As I explained, given that we can't meet in person every day, you use the happiness index tool for this. There's yet one more meeting, the sprint preparation meeting. The product owners, ideally with a good software developer, need to meet in advance of the sprint planning meeting to prepare that sprint planning. And in this meeting, they go over the product backlog, look at the requirements and so forth. I will revisit this in a few slides. So this is the logical structure, right? You start with planning and you end with a review release retrospective. Now, that would mean two separate meetings, which is hard to do at a university. So we roll these two separate, logically separate meetings into one, the team meeting, the Amos team meeting. And then we make the Amos team meeting start 
with the closing of the last sprint in the middle of the team meeting we then switch to the new sprint and start planning the new sprint so it's uh, you close out the old sprint first and then you switch over to the new sprint and you do this back to back so that you need to have only one meeting in a given week rather than two <clears throat> so you can see the logical structure here in the run-up to the team meeting you have a meeting preparation um, after that eventually the team meeting starts with sprint review release retrospective maybe you'll take a bio break but you switch over to sprint planning in the middle of the team meeting perform the sprint planning and then the team meeting is over there's after work to be done but it's outside the team meeting i will now walk through these different activities and what needs doing i said it earlier on i want to repeat it this is effectively a checklist a step-by-step -step to do list of what we are expecting of you to do in the run-up to a team meeting during the team meeting and after the team meeting right now i am still we are still before the team meeting we need to prepare it the job for the product owner is to make sure in preparation of the team meeting that the product backlog, the first column of your feature board, is in a good state. It's called grooming the product backlog, uh, among other backlogs. So grooming the product backlog, making sure there are high quality requirements at the top of the product backlog so that they can be taken into the team meeting, can be decided upon, do we want to do it in this upcoming sprint, upcoming work week um, or not, and so forth. So the quality of the requirements highly prioritized for the upcoming work week to be discussed in the upcoming sprint planning, that needs to be done in advance of the meeting, not during the meeting. The product owner the two product owners typically then do that and since often there's some engineering content that may, may not be understandable right away to the product owner maybe they should get the help of a software developer product owners don't necessarily understand always the uh, engineering complexity of requirements and in order to create sufficiently small requirements so called in the form of product backlog items or user stories are sufficiently small ones that can actually be done during one uh, sprint uh, they may have to talk to an engineer about it is that small enough there's a significant difference between um, changing the color of a button button in a user interface and changing uh, a column in a database table uh, one is easy and the other not so much may not be easy so much so the product owners need to make sure most notably the feature board in particular the product backlog column of the feature board is ready for sprint planning that the criteria in there meet the so-called that the backlog items in there meet the so-called invest criteria which are quality criteria of the product backlog entries I'll return to that later. As I also mentioned, uh, while this is uh, debated hotly still, um, in Amos you can, next to new feature requests, new requirements, you can also put bug fixes and refactorings, basically every type of work into the uh, product backlog. The other role that needs to be active in preparation of the team meeting is the release manager role. The release manager does not exist as a role in Scrum proper. It's an addition by Amos, though it's a common role in software development. The job, the single job, the, you have one job. <laughs> the release manager's job is to make sure that a working demo system will be available during the team meeting as part of the sprint review part of the team meeting. We want 
a working demo system for show and tell to review the work that was done during the last week. If we cannot review the work in the form of a working demo, then you have, we have failed. You have failed. So we need the software to compile, to build, and it can be started, which is exactly what you will be doing during the sprint review. So the release manager needs to herd the cats. Maybe developers want to get their features in the very last second, but maybe they break the build, so then they shouldn't go in. So the release manager needs to admonish everyone, get your features in, get your commits in, in time, or you will kick them out. How do you kick them out? Well, you don't have them in the build that goes into the demo. And you do that by tagging what you consider you, the release manager, what you consider the stable version of the software for the demo. And you tag it with sprint so-and-so release candidate. Details are available in the homework document, the deliverables uh, and so forth. So you need to tag that version of the software that you want to demo of. Uh, you first tag the software before the team meeting, before the sprint uh, review and release, uh, as a release candidate. It's only a candidate. We have not decided to release yet, but it's a candidate for it. And then actually, if later during the team meeting, you decide that the software is good and you want to release it as the sprint release, then you add another tag the actual release tag. You can see it here, Sprint07 release candidate. That's before the meeting, the release candidate. And then Sprint07 release during the team meeting for the actual release. If you don't get it done during the team meeting, you only cast the decision. You can, of course, uh, tag it after the meeting as well. Do the work uh, calmly and focused. But the point is it's a separate tag for the actual release because in between the release candidate and can and the actual release you might actually decide to do very small fixes that's usually okay and release that so there can be a difference between the release candidate and the release so let's assume i'm quite sure you will have properly prepared for the team meeting Product owners, release managers, all of this work was done in advance of the team meeting. Then you come together for the team meeting. And it starts with the sprint review. We're closing out the old sprint. So what we first do is we review the work that we did in the previous sprint. First step is for the release manager to build uh, the demo to show that it's actually working. So you check out the code, the code from your GitHub repository uh, using the appropriate release candidate tag in front of everyone else. You're sharing the screen, you're showing your terminal, you're doing your Git clone or you're doing your, um, you run your build tool and so forth. You make it compile, well, you run your build tool and uh, hopefully it uh, compiles, builds and some tests run. I understand that this is not going to work the very first week, not right now, but this is where you should get to because that's what professionals do. And you deploy your software if there's a separate deployment environment, otherwise you will probably run it off your workstation. Now the release manager has shown at the beginning of the sprint review that the software builds and is ready for demoing. I understand that over time uh, you may want to do it in advance of the team meeting if the build actually takes a long time, but uh, we will ask at certain points in time of you to show it to us. We want to see it properly. Good builds are independent of people, are run of proper build scripts and so forth. More on that later. Continuing with the sprint review, now that it's ready, now that the software, the product being developed, the software being developed is ready for review, the product owner takes over and they walk through the features, uh, the 
items in the awaiting review column of the feature board. So in the feature board, you work with the different jobs you have as described by a card or an entry or an item in the uh, feature board. And during a work week, you move any work that needs doing through its different stages from uh, it's, uh, it's being planned, it's being worked on in progress to it has been done, which is awaiting review. Because we make a difference between the developer thinks they finished and the product owners who wrote the requirements think it finished. So there's a step from awaiting review, which is the status that the developer sets, to it's in the feature archive now because it was signed off on by the product owner. The product owner, again, back here, goes through all the entries, one after another, in the awaiting review column and asks the developers for each of these items uh, to demo them. So the product owner points to the first item, asks who did this, the developer, one developer or a pair, um, raises the hand and they demo it. It's key that they don't just talk about it. They need to show the running feature. There must be a way to show that it does what it's supposed to do. The product owner then checks up on it. Uh, the product owner looks at the acceptance criteria that they formulated for the requirement for the feature and checks up on whether the implementation fulfills those acceptance criteria. Uh, if there's a definition of done, something we'll introduce later, the product owner or the team checks whether the definition of done was achieved as well. And there may be other uh, criteria. Is it not failing in the background with a gazillion of exceptions or something? So you may want to look at logging output. And all of this needs to come together and be good for the product owner to say, yes, this implementation fulfills what I wanted you to do. And this meets the requirements. And so now it is signed off on and we'll move the entry from the awaiting review column to the feature archive. If the product owner decides, nope, it's not been done well or something is missing, which is not a big deal that can happen, then the product owner moves the item from awaiting review back to the top of the product backlog. So it gets kicked back to start <laughs> and uh, to be thought about in the upcoming planning round. So there's a decision by the product owner for one item and it's one item after another. You don't do multiple items at once. You walk through the items and each item individually gets demoed by the respective developer who worked on it. And for each item, the product owner asks questions and investigates, is that really what I wanted? and then individually signs off on that item. Don't do the items and badges. Don't do the column as one. Always do each item in the column one after another. So as I just explained, the product owner walks through these items and calls upon an individual developer for one particular item. The developer um, responds to that. They demo the item. Uh, they answer the questions that the product owner may have. And if the product owner says that's good, uh, they also tell the product owner what they think the real size uh, of the feature, the real complexity was um, now that they are done. Um, we haven't discussed it yet. Later, we will talk about estimating the complexity or size of features and we need to track it as well. So we will do the estimation during planning and we will, uh, when we finished it, provide a real size. So once more, the developer shows by demoing software, not by talking about it, demoing, showing, not just talking. So if you can't have anything, if you don't have anything to show, then something is wrong. So ideally, you always have something to show and the product owners should invest in, should, should insist on that.
once you have gone through all the items you've cleared out the awaiting review items most items hopefully are in the feature archive because they were properly implemented and those which haven't have been pushed back to the product backlog for the next planning round now that we have finished with that we have finished reviewing the work that was supposed to be done in the work week in the sprint now we will have to decide on whether what's there as code now is a proper sprint release does this new state of the software new compared to last sprint the last release improve the value have more functionality that's useful to the user to the customer or not if everything's broken nothing works you should not release but if there is now an increment of value meaning it's more useful than the last version then you should release the software you should not release if there's significant regression things are not working at all but if there's new functionality that's useful you should try to release Later in the course, when I introduce definition of done, you'll get a more formal checklist of this. Right now, you look at it and see the new functionality is there and it's doing its job. That's good. That's improvement. So let's release the sprint release. But there is no requirement to release. If you feel it's not good, you shouldn't be releasing. It also does not, does not affect your grade or anything. It's the product owner's decision. Um, to see whether the software improved and there's new value. If they feel uncertain because, well, how many bugs are there really, they can, of course, ask the software developers and uh, decide based on that. Now, with a decision by the product owner, uh, the release manager, if so, can cut the actual release. Assuming the product owner said, yeah, let's release, the release manager can now uh, release. Releasing means as a first step setting the appropriate uh, tag and um, after that uh, from that build for that tag assuming it's the same you just have deploy the software into the proper operating environment. If there is a change log you're keeping you can document the changes over the last uh, sprint. Uh, sprint release. So now you release the software. You finished the review of the software, decided to release, and then you released the software. And as the final step in closing out the old sprint, you perform the sprint retrospective. So review, release, retrospective, three R's, and that's the closing of the sprint. In the retrospective, you care about process improvement by looking over last sprint, the last sprint, identifying problems and identifying opportunities for improvement. The Scrum Master, this is the Scrum Master's territory, the Scrum Master reviews the impediments and improvements that happened during uh, the sprint in terms of they worked on those and they got those impediments improvements from the last retrospective so one sprint back one retrospective back there were some discussions I get to that on problems there are so-called impediments and improvements the team wanted to undertake and the scrum master reports about what came of those initiatives but now during the retrospective, so after reporting on that, that's just the Scrum Master reporting, but after that, the Scrum Master now asks for new issues. So after the Scrum Master reported, they then continue on to performing a roll call where they call on every team member, product owners, software developers, and they can even add, include themselves. They perform a roll call where everyone reports on what has gone well, what hasn't gone well, as well as suggestions on what they think they can do better. There are many different ways of how you, that's the actual call 
a scrum retrospective, a narrow sprint retrospective. There are many different ways actually of what you can do here, but as a minimum, that's how we start. The Scrum Master asks what has gone well, what hasn't gone well, what can we do better? And everyone individually makes a short statement on this. No long discussion. It's an update. It's just saying what went well, what didn't go well, what do we want to do better? Everyone individually without an ensuing discussion. And then you go around. That's the roll call. The uh, product, ma the Scrum Master writes down what they hear. These are the new impediments and improvements to be discussed. And then they um, look at those and prioritize them and go back to the people outside of the retrospective uh, to discuss the severity and potentially work on it. And then a sprint uh, and then a team meeting later as part of the opening of the retrospective, they will report about what they did here. This is the initial basic version of Scrum and your Scrum Master may come with more elaborate versions of this during the uh, evolution of the course as the Scrum Masters learn more about how to do it better and better in the coach course. But for now, the basic structure of the sprint retrospective as led by a Scrum Master is like this. And of course, you help your Scrum Master and respond. And as the final step in the sprint retrospective, everyone, software developers, product owners, and even the Scrum Master answer to the happiness index, meaning fill in their happiness. And then you're done with this old sprint. You are still in the middle of the team meeting now but you closed out the old sprint and you are now switching over to the new sprint. The new sprint starts with sprint planning. For sprint planning, the uh, product owner needs to get even more active than they already are. And for sprint planning, the product owner now needs to talk about the work they want to see getting done. The work that needs doing uh, is the work in the product backlog. And um, as you look at your feature board, you will see that there's the product backlog, which is the leftmost column. The product backlog was nicely prepared, but then some product back, some items were added from the awaiting review column, those items that weren't quite finished. And maybe there are still items either in work or in uh, the sprint uh, backlog column. If they're in the sprint backlog column, they should also be moved to the product backlog uh, column. And the items in the product backlog on the fly, that's the capability and skills of the product owners, should be sorted and prioritized on the fly to meet how important they are. So. Every sprint planning starts anew with reviewing the work to be done and even the work that was already in progress needs to be reconsidered whether it's still so important. It's possible that work that you were working on during the course of the sprint, the product owner decided, oh, that was wrong. That's actually not valuable at all. And then you stop and then you will not pick it up again in the new sprint in case it wasn't finished. So the product owner is responsible that at the start of the sprint planning, there is a nicely structured, well prioritized set of product backlog items in the product backlog, the leftmost column of your feature board. And then the product owner walks through that product backlog, the leftmost column, one item after another from the top. So the product owner takes the top product backlog item and suggests that it be done in the upcoming sprint. And if the developers agree, then they do it. Uh, then it will, uh, will be done. For that, the product owner moves the item from the product backlog, leftmost column to the sprint backlog, uh, second from the left column. And then the product owner picks the next 
uh, item, the second most pri highly prioritized one, the third most highly prioritized one, and so forth. It only stops when the team says that's enough work, that's enough backlog items in the sprint backlog, the second column now, and that will be plenty for the upcoming sprint. Now let's take a closer look at how that works in detail. The product owners can only present what they want to get done. They cannot tell the team to do it. The product owners can only say this is what needs doing and this is how important it is. And then they work off a strict order of significance or importance or priority. The developers need to respond to the requests by the product owners, meaning as a product owner says, this is the top item, we need to do that. They, the developers respond by estimating the size of that item so that they know how complex it will be. And, uh, and uh, if they agree to do it, uh, then that's put again into the sprint backlog item. Now that they know how complex or big the first item is, uh, they can look at the second item from the perspective of can we also do it or is it too much now? Um, second item is unlikely to be a problem if the product backlog items are small enough, but third, fourth, fifth, sixth, eventually mm, that's one item too many and they'll stop. So as the product owners say, here's one more item to do, the developers estimate it and commit to doing it in the upcoming sprint but eventually it will be enough and they stop. So how do they actually plan or estimate the size or complexity of a particular product backlog item, feature, bug fix, refactoring that a product owner is proposing? Well, they do it using a practice called planning poker, resting on the idea of story points as a measure for complexity or size of a, of a feature in the product backlog. So story points, now to start with the measure or the metric, the measure here. A story point is an arbitrary numeric measure of size or complexity of a given backlog item. I say size or complexity because we want it to be independent of people. So it can't be how long it will take you because how long the implementation of a feature takes you uh, depends on a person. If you ask two people, how long will it take you? You will get two different answers if they are of different capability. We are really trying to come to conclusions on the size and complexity independently of who is going to do it. Now you may ask, what, what do you mean by arbitrary? If something's arbitrary, it's not, well, not worth anything. That's actually not true. The key here is if you look at a feature and decide it's considered worth five story points, which makes it in prose a large size feature, then you decided that's what it is. That's arbitrary the first time you do it. You do it for a second time if you come to the conclusion that something is of size five, large size as well then it better be of the same size as the previous version. So while the allocation of points at the beginning may be arbitrary, as long as you're consistent over time and sort same size backlog items into the same category or same number of points, as long as you do that, you will get consistent estimation, similar size or same size items, get the same number of story points, and that will allow you to do some prediction and planning later on. And this is actually better than randomness, and you can get something out of it. But how do you get to those points? Well, as you just heard, these are really more categories, so it doesn't matter whether it's precisely 4.9, 5, or 5.1. It's a category, it's either a 3 or a 5, which roughly corresponds to, say, medium or large size. But you'll only get these good estimates if you draw on the general 
intelligence and abilities of the whole team. Because rarely does any one person have the complete picture. You're all very smart people. You need to pull together. And coming to a team consensus is managed or organized by a process or a practice called planning poker. So here we need to organize people to come together and decide this is a three or this is a five for a particular feature item. So you can see it as a set of steps here, arguably. Um, at the beginning of planning poker, the planning for one picture, picture, one feature, <laughs> the product owner picks that feature, the high, most highly prioritized item from the product backlog. The product owner explains it, reads the story, explains the story, so the user story is the format for the backlog entry. And then the developers may have questions. The developers should ask questions. How do you mean this product owner? What, what do you mean by this? Here are some open issues. The goal is to establish a shared understanding of what the feature is about. As we will see later, as we review how to describe or specify features and requirements, we will see that user stories are fairly lightweight and hardly complete formal specif specifications. They serve the purpose of establishing a shared understanding. It's not a formal specification. It's not people independent. You need to get it from one head, the product owners, into the develop another head, the developer's head. And you only do that if people talk to each other. So the product owner explains it and the developers ask questions about it. And they should ask questions to make sure there's a shared understanding of what this is about. Once that ends, enough questions have been asked and developers think individually by themselves that they know what this feature means, they will also be able to form a first opinion of its complexity or size. So they think by themselves, is that a three or a five? What is that? I don't know. But they think about it and decide by themselves individually. They don't discuss numbers yet. They play all at once the card. That's where planning poker comes from. It used to be physical cards with numbers on it. They play a card, on, put it on the table. With that number, they think is, rep is the actual size of the, um, of the um, feature at hand. So some, some uh, developers will play a three, others will play a five. Maybe someone will play a one and another person will play a 13. And you will get diverging opinions and that is good. It's good because people have different perspectives and everyone has something to contribute that others may not have seen. So in the first round of playing the cards, it's unlikely that everyone has come to the conclusion this is a five or a three. Everyone plays their cards without showing everyone, anyone else first. And then it's on the table and you can see, okay, a couple of threes, a couple of fives, but here is an eight and here's a one. So the product owner now calls on the outliers. The eight, the two. Can you explain, please, why you think this is so small? Presumably the others are thinking it's much larger. Or can you explain why you think it's so complicated, given that the others think it should be much easier? So the individual developer now, who had an outlier as an opinion when compared with the rest, please explains why they came to that conclusion. Oh, we really need to dig deep into the database to make that change. And that means setting up a new schema evolution framework and then running it on all our data. But we have these unclear semantics on that particular table and not to talk about the cross reference, whatever it is, uh, they explain it. And then the others will respond, either ask questions, but usually they uh, the first outlier will just uh, 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 explain it and then the product owner will point to the second outlier the other direction, either the large or the small one, and they will explain it and then others will chime in. Others may disagree and they point out, no, no, it won't be so complicated because this or that, and that's all fine. Once the discussion has run its course, the developers now have a newly have 
perhaps a changed opinion on the complexity. They heard things where it might be harder than expected. They heard reasons why it might be easier than expected. And they may have changed their opinion on the complexity. So they think by themselves again and they play another round. In that second round and third round, they play their cards again. And maybe the values of the uh, feature sizes they played as cards changed and got closer to each other. So you should be playing two or three rounds like this and hopefully at some round it converges. And if at the end everyone is a three and there's one five, make it a three or so, unless the person with the five really object, objects. But the key is, as you discuss things, you improve that shared understanding and you pull together on one particular complexity or size for the feature as a shared experience so that later on other features of the same size will get the same, this very size and other features of a higher complexity will get another size. So you are doing two things. You are building your understanding of the specific feature, whoever gets to do it, and you're also calibrating yourself on consistently estimating same size features with the same size and different size features with the different size and complexity so that you actually get reasonable sizes that kind of match the complexity wherever they are anchored and you can later use that for planning as you pick up features one after another first feature second feature third feature you can see the story points piling up the first one was a five the second one was a three the third one was another three then an eight and eventually you will start feeling mm, isn't this enough uh, work for the upcoming sprint and so you decide after you played one more feature whether you can take on yet another one or whether this is good enough for the upcoming sprint so the product owner should always ask after you finished estimating one side, one feature and it was moved in the, into the sprint backlog column by the product owner, can you take one more feature or not? And if the team says, no, now it's enough, you stop. But if the team says, well, we can take one more feature, you play and estimate one more feature. The product owner adjusts or works with the product backlogs and any, any feature that gets estimated and agreed upon is moved from the product backlog the first column to the sprint backlog the second column in the feature board and now we know it's ready for doing in the upcoming sprint i explained it verbally i hope it was kind of illustrative you can play car you could play cards if you're physically together we still have those old card decks for playing planning poker and scrum given that all teams pretty much are virtual or distributed. Uh, please look at the last tab in the planning document where there is a, a planning poker cards replacement, a very simple way of playing planning poker. It um, needs a, a pattern of uh, you or the product owner saying, okay, all everyone thinks by yourself and now type in your value and hit return all at the same time so that you get to see the uh, values in parallel without getting primed by somebody else's opinion. And once you have done that, once you have agreed upon, these are the product backlog items that we want to do in the upcoming sprint. So they are in the sprint backlog column of the feature board. Uh, you're basically done with the uh, with the sprint planning and you're done now not only with the sprint planning but you just finished the team meeting as well there's after work to be done after the team meeting so the product owner typically created some chaos or some dust uh, in the various documents so it needs cleaning up that's uh, that's straightforward um, often developers want to make a distinction between a feature which is a user story and is business value oriented and development tasks to be undertaken to implement a feature. So you can break down a feature into tasks. If it's done well, maybe features and tasks are very close to each other. So each feature is basically one task. They have not been assigned yet once the, during the decision on doing that feature. 
If you want to, you can extend the team meeting or do it as part of the team meeting that people put their name or their finger on a particular feature. Officially allocating features to people who get to do them is not part of a team is not part of sprint planning or our team meeting. If you're good, then if you have time, of course you can squeeze it in. More traditionally though, it's the developers after the team meeting who go through the features they decided they would do in the upcoming sprint, uh, break them down into tasks, maybe create even more cards for that, and then individually decide what to work on. They just pick what's available in the sprint backlog and start working on it. They uh, pick on it and they declare it what they are working on by moving it into the in progress column and putting their name on the item or on the card representing the feature. The Scrum Master uh, in the upcoming week, well, first of all, the Scrum Master documents what they heard in the imp, imp squared backlog, and they work on the impediments and improvements coming up uh, for, the, for the work. So team meetings may sound like they're a lot, and maybe they are in the beginning. Um, almost all Amos teams we've ever had were at the end of Amos very comfortable getting a sprint meeting done in the 90 minutes or much less easily. Here's a rough idea how rough breakdown. Um, I think closing out the old sprint uh, with the review release retrospective that's about half of the time maybe 60% and sprint planning is 40%, maybe 50% of the time. These are the rough distributions of how, if it's working well, you might want to spend your time. That was the team meeting. So you will get to experience it uh, today for the first time. And one more time, use this particular slide deck and step through the meeting step by step so you're not missing important things because this is what we'll be looking out for as to whether you understand the process of Scrum as used in Amos. Now on then to new deliverables. The Bill of Materials, Stückliste in German, um, is a list of, well, the components or the parts uh, constituting whatever you're talking about. In the case of software, uh, it is the uh, libraries or the components you're using uh, that you're including in your software and that you're building on, also called the dependencies. So you're developing some software, that's the primary software, but whatever they use is what they depend on Hence dependencies, and this list and the, so and these dependencies form usually a large and deep graph of uh, well libraries and components, usually open source, and this large and deep graph once flattened into a list, that's called the software bill of materials. And we want you to be as professional as you can be, so you need to document your bill of materials and you need to provide these five pieces of information for each material, each item in your bill of materials. Uh, we want to know the libraries, so they have a name and they are part of some framework or some other larger context. They have a version, they have a license, and maybe you want to document where you pulled it from, which package manager, because that could also be important. So this way you're documenting your dependencies and so you know what's in your code in case there are, for example, uh, vulnerabilities becoming available. There are lots and lots of vulnerabilities being disclosed all the time, but if you don't know you're using software for which a new vulnerability has become known, well, then you don't know that this vulnerability also applies to you. So in order to know that, you need to take stock of what your dependencies are and only if you know your dependencies can you recognize that some vulnerability for example applies to you. There are other reasons for having a bill of material but this was one. 
and you need to create one. Uh, so initialize a software bill of materials with your initial list of uh, dependencies and uh, put them into the tab in the planning documents. Right now, that's the easiest thing we can do. Later on, we will look for better solutions. Put it there by hand and so we know what you're depending on. You can limit this to your first level dependencies, meaning those components that you are directly using against whose interfaces, APIs you are programming. You don't have to include the second level, third level dependencies, meaning those components that your dependencies depend on. So as I said, it's a deep graph. You don't have to look beyond level, uh, the top level, your first level dependencies. And you can even create those using a tool. Uh, there are plenty of tools to create the software bill of materials, but you need to put it into the spreadsheet and uh, update that spreadsheet once you change your dependencies, if you add new libraries. So please start doing it from now on. Finally, there is um, another piece, a new deliverable, uh, an, agile, an architecture, uh, to have an idea of an architecture. Now that is a weird thing in Agile methods because people might tell you our architecture is Agile. We do it on the fly. Agile methods don't like detailed planning. There's good reasons for it. That's why we have Agile methods. The proof of the software is in the feedback of the customer. But uh, there is definitely uh, serious cost savings to be had by having a good architecture that can be changed with limited uh, effort rather than stopping everything dead in its tracks. So a software architecture is the overall design of a system. There are two main components or main aspects to it. The static uh, structure, the code relationships, and the dynamic uh, aspects, the dynamic structure, the runtime relationships between objects instantiated from the static structure, the code, the classes, etc. And how those relate, uh, that's called the architecture, the design of a system. There are many different languages and what have you. It's an active topic of research in software engineering, and that would be the software architecture. An agile software architecture here then is one which you don't have to finalize in the beginning, don't have to detail in the beginning, but which does exist in the form of well, diagrams or descriptions of whatever sort of sort, but where you don't hesitate to change it. So I call it risk adjusted, meaning you do plan, you do sketch out an architecture, but you don't over invest. I can't put it more nicely at this stage and I'm actually not aware of any better explanation than this, but we do want you to think about architecture. We do want you to put it down and so that at least you've spent some thoughts on it and are not blindly running into an implementation. Here's a most basic uh, illustration of these two aspects I want to hear about, the static code structure and the dynamic runtime. Mostly I'm displaying this because students coming to our classes often haven't had a software architecture class or, and are at a loss how to talk about software, software design, software architecture beyond the code level. Um, you can talk about software architecture again along these two dimensions, static and dynamic. Both are illustrated here in the same di Well, um, some are illustrated here. Uh, the code architecture, this is a very simplified class diagram. So you see classes, object, model object, UI widget, uh, widget and so forth. Class hierarchies like model object is the superclass of business object, which is a superclass of savings account and so forth. These are classes and their relationships are the static code relationships. It's what you see when you type stuff in your editor when you program. And they are often split into layers, code layers. Uh, so for example, you might have a platform layer 
like the Java JDK. You might have a framework layer on top of uh, the Java JDK, like Spring Framework or Spring Boot. That's an additional layer uh, above or below, whichever way you're looking at it, but it's classes derived from the platform layer. And then you may have your application, which further inherits from Spring Boot or uses Spring Boot. So you have on the code level, at a minimum often these three layers, the platform, the framework you're using and your application. And it's programmed, it's, you see it in the code, you see the relationship. Now, as you run your program, you instantiate the objects and the code is getting uh, into full swing. That's the dynamics. And that is a wholly different dimension as you have one class, which may have many instances, and you need to understand that dynamics. And that's the runtime architecture, the runtime objects. And they, uh, to make it simple here, uh, are often structured differently from, say, the code layers. Uh, they are, for example, structured into tiers and they go left to right. The code layers go bottom to top and the runtime tiers go left to right. So a very common architecture is a three-tier architecture with a presentation or UI tier, a domain model or domain tier, and some database or persistence uh, tier. Sometimes people also call it layers. It's not been standardized. I try to use layer for one thing and tier for another. Basically, I try to use layer here for code and tier for runtime. So layers for static code relationships and tiers for runtime object relationships. And so you can see how the objects created from your application uh, for example, the interest calculator uh, class gets instantiated. Then you have your runtime object. It's in the presentation tier and it uses uh, the domain tier object, an instance of the savings account of class, maybe to calculate the interest you are getting from your savings account and the balance in there. And these are the objects at runtime. So as you uh, think about the architecture of the system you're going to devise. Think about both the static code structure, what are the libraries we're using, what are the classes, the key classes, not all of them, but the key classes you're going to develop and how do they relate, as well as how things play out at runtime. That's usually two separate diagrams. Please document that in a regular document, whatever tool. Uh, we want you to upload a PDF. So there's the runtime architecture, the static code architecture. And if you think it's appropriate, add that tech stack in terms of what technologies you're using on top of, in addition to your own static code architecture, which may be focused on your application. And of course, have fun at the end of the course, comparing your ideas from the beginning of the course with what finally came about at the end. So here we are. You are going to have your first team meeting after uh, lunch today. And uh, it has a very well-defined structure. It uh, closes out the old sprint with a sprint review release retrospective and then switches into the new sprint where you plan it. And that will be a challenge perhaps to get it done right the first time, but it will get easier over time and you have your Scrum Master to guide you. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I look forward to seeing you in class.